And go directly into the message tonight as uh, there's, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, information I'd like to cover this evening. Uh, we're going to continue our study in the book of Judges, and uh, so we want to go ahead and go forward. So let's get your Bibles out, if you will, tonight. We'll be in Judges chapter 6 this evening. Judges in chapter 6, as I said, we're going to uh, continue on our Sunday evening sermon series from the book of Judges. And our goal is to, is to preach uh, one sermon out of each chapter and uh, take a practical approach to it. Uh, there's quite a bit of information in the sixth chapter. We're not going to obviously not do a verse by verse study on it. Um, but tonight I would go ahead and say that this is going to be a bit of preaching mixed in with teaching. And uh, my pastor, uh, Pastor Jim Ellis, who led me to the Lord, um, was one of those famous, what I call a famous uh, preacher teacher. Amen. He preached the Word of God hard. And, uh, he preached it true, he preached, preached it sound, but in his preaching was always teaching. And uh, I think that is a mark of preaching that we're missing today. Uh, there are a multitude of sermons out there that really convict us and uh, have a great change in our life. And, and those things are, are needed. Uh, but I think there needs to be a mixture of sermons out there that are both uh, uh, you know, exhaustive in the teaching of the Word of God as well as evangelizing our hearts and and, uh, and, and souls that who will be in attendance. So well, we want to make sure we exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to preach exhortation, um, but, but we want to make sure an exhaustive study uh, of the Word of God is also intermingled in our sermons. So Judges in chapter 6 tonight, we'll begin in verse 1, if you'll kindly stand as we honor the reading of the Word of God. And we're going to look at a few things here tonight uh, under the heading or under the subtopic of God's power and providence. God's power... And Proverbs, Judges chapter 6 and in verse 1, the Bible says, The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. The hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them, uh, them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they, came up against them. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, again for the wonderful opportunity to be in your house together tonight. We do pray a special blessing upon the reading of thy word. Speak to our hearts tonight. Give us clear understanding, dear Lord, of your word. Help us apply it into our life and how we can better and greater serve you. So we give you the honor, glory, and praise for everything that is said and done. In the name of thy Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we do ask these things. Amen. And amen. Thank you so much. And please be seated. A few things that we find here in Judges in chapter 6 in the opening text. Uh, number one, I want us to look here at the point that in chapter 5, uh, chapter 5 ends with the 31st verse stating, And the land had rest for 40 years. If you'll notice that in your scripture, or you can read it from up top. And the land had rest for 40 years. When we, we then see the opening verses of chapter 6 uh, state the phrase seven years. If you look in the end of verse 1, it says, and The Lord uh, delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. Now, beloved, this is a peculiar phenomenon uh, that it occurs throughout the Scriptures time and time again. Uh, the number 7 and the numbers uh, 40 always, or, or not always, but multitude of times they appear together and they do so se uh, several times throughout the Word of God. Uh, there's even occasions when the Scriptures are almost forced to put them together for no apparent reason whatsoever, uh, yet maybe just for continuity's sake. Uh, some of those examples would be Genesis 7, 4 and uh, Genesis 25, 17 and verse 20. 2 Kings 8, 3 and verse 9, uh, 2 Kings 12, 1, and Numbers chapter 13, verses 22 and 25. And uh, I just have those up there. You can see them. Maybe you jot them down while I make a few other points concerning these two numbers here, and then we'll get into the meat of the message tonight. Uh, I don't have all the answers. I'll go ahead and tell you that. I don't have all the answers concerning the purpose. However, we do understand that, that um that it must be linked to Israel and their time of testing or tribulations, if you will. Forty, we know, is the number of testing or the number of trial. Uh, and number and seven is the number of the uh, years of the tribulation period. 
Um, so we, we don't really have all the answers. How do we conclude this from the, the numbers? How do we conclude that seven is the number of the tribulation period? Of course, we know that through various scriptures. How do we know about the number of testing and trials? Well, if you read in Daniel chapter 7, verses 25 through 27, you find out that Daniel's 70th week, that it's called, uh, which we know as the tribulation period, or also known as the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, the tribulation period, there's seven years. Uh, it's split into uh, two halves of three and a half years, or two halves of 42 months, or two halves of 1260 days. They are equal to 30 day months, biblically speaking. Uh, we see a prophetical week is uh, seven years, and so we know that 69 of those years have been fulfilled, or 483 literal years, and Israel owes God seven more years. So we know the number seven is associated with the tribulation period. We also know this, that 40 is a time of testing. It's a time of trial. Now, it's found with Moses, who's on Mount Sinai, 40 days and 40 night, nights in Exodus 24, verse 18. Uh, Goliath challenges Israel for 40 days in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 16. Jesus Christ was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights and found in Matthew chapter 4, verse 2, Mark chapter 1, verse 13, and Luke 4, verse 2. Now, I'm giving you all of those things right there. You can go back to the audio or the video later on, and you can confirm those dates if you would like. But I'm giving you those things so that Scripture will answer Scripture. And that's the key, guys. The Bible needs to answer the Bible. You don't need my opinion. Uh, you don't need someone else's opinion. You don't need what somebody thinks. You need to know what the Scripture says about itself. So now back in Judges chapter 6, we find once again that Israel continues this cycle of apostasy, punishment, repentance, delivery, and apostasy again. Uh, I was, I've got to be honest with you, I was a bit shocked when I was reading in Judges chapter 6. Actually, I, can't, I don't see how somebody shocked twice, but I was shocked twice. Uh, when you look at verse 1, it says, And the children of Israel did evil uh, in the sight of the Lord. And, and honestly, when I was reading that, in my mind, the word that I wanted to say was, again, I'm not going to superimpose the word on the Word of God. The Word of God uh, uh, has the words that it needs. It has the words that it means. Uh, don't let anybody ever tell you that there should be a different word or an extra word or lack of word. Uh, we have in our Bible, our King James Bible, exactly the words that God wants us to have. Amen? They're purified, they are preserved, and they are perfect in the form that they are written before you tonight. But in my mind, just in the continuity of studying the book of Judges, I wanted almost to say, and the children of Israel did heal on the side of the Lord again. Because here is this continual cycle of them uh, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, repenting before God, and then all of a sudden uh, he sends the deliverer, and then they do what? They commit apostasy yet again. So we see this, that Israel continues this cycle. The first thing that I want us to see in Judges chapter 6 tonight, just really, it's, it is point number one, but it's almost an introductory point. I wrestled with the fact of whether or not I even make it an appointment. I went ahead and did it uh, because I have a weakness of alliterating a sermon, and I understand that. I just love to alliterate. But we find here in Judges chapter 6 that there is a prophetical piece of the picture here. There's a prophetical piece of the picture. So we'll lay the groundwork in the prophecy tonight, if you will, looking in verse 3. Looking in verse 3, the Bible said, And so it was when Israel had sown, that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. They camped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth, um, till now uh, come unto Gaza, and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ash. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. <laughs> this time what the Lord does in order to punish the nation of Israel is that he sends the Midianites to come in and to raid the crops and to raid the cattle, to raid all the, the, uh, the livestock, if you will. So what you find in verses 3 through 5 is a great picture of fiscal judgment upon a nation. We're going to see the very same thing again, uh, uh, same thing again 
uh, as a typological picture of the Antichrist during that Daniel 70th week that we spoke about. During that last seven years, that tribulation period, if you will, you'll see the same thing in typology from Judges 6. We see that same picture of a fiscal judgment upon a nation. Now, if I was to take that and put that to a practical application today, we can look at all of our nations in this world that when they turn their back on God, God will judge that nation financially, financially, amen? You look at the United States of America tonight, I love America, I think America is a great nation, but as a, as a nation, America has begun to turn its back against God. Now with all the things going on in the world today, with the rise, the re, the re uh, I should say the reascension of um, communism and world power and terrorism all over the world, you have people over there squawking the squall, and we have a, a so-called world leader today going around the world making apologies for the past wars, okay? I make no apologies to Hiroshima, uh, and it's not Hiroshima, it's Hiroshima, amen. Uh, I make no uh, apologies to Nagasaki. Listen, they bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, and you know what? That's the wages of war. If you did not want the bomb dropped on you, you shouldn't have had a silent attack upon America on December 7th. No, just like Toji, Toji Yantamoto said himself, I fear that the only thing that we have done was awake a sleeping giant, and that's what they did. Amen and amen. I like what Winston Churchill said well, just after the bombing of Pearl Harbor as he popped a bottle of champagne and he told his advisors, we have just won the war because America got in full force and what happened? Now, but we got a president or a leader now who's going around making apologies to everyone in Vietnam and Japan, uh, Germany, all of these things that he's done. He's apologizing for the past. Absolutely ridiculous. Here we are as a nation, not only America, but the United Kingdom and a multitude of nations have a war against terrorism. We're trying to protect our people, but you're apologizing for defending yourself over the past hundred years. And to top it all off, an agenda pushed to rob the sanctity and the safety of our, our, our daughters, our children in restrooms anymore. Absolutely. Why should that be a tie? What it is is a diversion, and I'm not going to get into all of it tonight. But what I want us to understand <clears throat> that when God begins to judge a nation, He does so financially. We see it when countries begin to go on a financial demise, just like the United States of America has done. It has gone on a financial demise. Why is that? Because they are turning their backs against God. It's happened in the United Kingdom. It happened in Germany. It happened in France. It happened in Spain. It happened all over the world where God once had a massive presence the nation began to turn their back against God. He began to judge them in a fiscal or a financial type of judgment. We find the same thing here with the nation of Israel. The Midianites, you need to understand, the Midianites, just like the Ishmaelites, were some of, uh, some of the rejected sons of Abraham. Read Genesis chapter 25 from up top tonight. Genesis 25 verses 1 and 2, the Bible says... Uh, then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bare to him Zimran, and Jukshan, and Midan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. Now you skip down to verse 5, and Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away, mark this in your heart, sent them away from Isaac his son while he yet lived, eastward unto the east. Country. Notice Genesis 25, when Abram sent away the sons of the concubines, he sent them where? To the east country. Now back in your minds, in Judges chapter 6, the Midianites come against Israel with who? The Amalekites, who is the, great, uh, who is the grandson of the rejected son of Isaac, Esau, if you remember him, Judges, I mean, uh, Genesis 36, 12, and the children of the east. Notice that back, go down there to the verse... Um, Three says the Amalekites, which is the grandson of the rejected son of Isaac, who is Esau. Esau means red. Remember, he was sent away. And the children of the east. See, the implication here that you find is that the Midianites led a coalition of nations who had been ostracized by God from the Abrahamic covenant. You should need to keep this in mind of the world we are today. Being a child of Abraham means nothing when it comes to the covenant of God. 
God, God made a covenant with Abraham to give the land of Canaan in Genesis chapter 13, but he had intentions on giving it through only one particular son. That commandment is in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Genesis 21 verse 10, read it from up top. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Now you can cross-reference that with the book of Galatians. Galatians in chapter 4 and verse 30. Nevertheless, uh, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. The free woman we know was Sarah, and that free child was Isaac, of whom the, uh, the covenant that Ab of Abraham that God had with Abraham would continue through his seed. Amen. Through Isaac, not through Ishmael, and not through any of the children that came from the concubines, they were sent eastward. So what you find here in this prophetical piece of, of when God judges the nation of Israel, because they turned their back on Him again and went into apostasy, you find that it was a group of these ostracized descendants of Abraham. When it comes to the covenant, I know I'm repeating myself, but when it comes to the covenant of God, being a son of Abraham... That does not matter. What matters is who God chose to send that covenant through. And we know that his seed, that the covenant was going to go through, was that of Isaac, the promised seed. So again, the prophetical picture that we have here, uh, you, we have here in the world today is, is, is and I understand Islam was not around uh, in the book of Judges. It didn't show up until, uh, until, uh, six, um, until the 6th century A.D., um, anyway, or 7th century A.D. actually, I believe. But the prophetical picture here is you almost see a confederation of nation, a confederation of Middle Eastern, a Muslim types of nation, a Muslim confederation of nations who come against Israel. The prophetical picture is they're coming against Israel when in the tribulation period. So that's the prophetical piece of the picture in Judges chapter 6. Their goal is to completely wipe out the nation. Just as the sweet psalmist wrote uh, of Israel when he wrote in Psalm 83 verse 4, they have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may no more be in remembrance. Notice what they did in these verses that we've read and then we'll move on to point number two. Notice what they did. In uh, verse four it says, and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth. Verse four, till thou shalt come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ash. And they came up for the cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers from multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy. They, want, they wanted them completely wiped out. They wanted to wipe them off the face of the planet. Now let me ask you a question. If I was to say that, that, uh, uh, that this coalition of, of, of uh, nations that are coming against Israel wanted Israel wiped off the face of the planet and to be remembered no more, what would that remind you of this, uh, this evening? It reminds you of certain world leaders from certain nations who hate Israel who have said the same thing in our modern day. So now, you see the prophecy from all the way back here in the book of Judges that's transposed all the way to the tribulation period. Those seven years that Israel was gone. That's the judgment against His people. Remember, the tribulation period is, in, is intended for the nation of Israel because of their rejection against God and their disobedience against God for the 490 years that we find. So the purpose of this event in Judges chapter 6 <clears throat> is the same purpose that we find that the tribulation period is, and it is that of punishment. Look in verses 6 through 10 with me. That of punishment, if you will, tonight. The Bible says, And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet, among, a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you uh, out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But ye, watch this, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Beloved, what happens here? 
is that the Lord quickly lays down the law for what He has done for Israel and what they have done against Him. The application is both historical and prophetical. But despite the application toward the chosen nation of God, can we, can we turn this on to ourselves tonight just a little bit? How often do we see this happen in the lives of Christians today? I mean, you know, for that matter, how often do we see it both in the lives of the saved and the lost? When things are going well, when the bills are paid, when the wife is happy, when the kids are happy, when everybody's uh, healthy, happy, and wise, and having a good time, and, and, and promotions are coming our way, or we tend to relax. We tend to shut our Bibles. We tend to quit praying and spend more time doing other things. And then all of a sudden, something happens, and we fall to our knees, and we cry out, Lord, help me. We don't read our Bibles like we normally do when things are going great. We don't pray like we normally should. We don't pray with fervency sometimes uh, when things are just going hunky-dory. The minute tragedy comes, we do, we do just like Israel did uh, through the times of the judges. As soon as tragedy comes, as soon as punishment arrives, we cry out to God to come to our safety. And unfortunately, I wonder if the Lord bails us out. We'll straighten up for a while. We'll do right. We'll serve Him. We'll be happy. We'll be faithful. We'll give and we'll, 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 we'll do the things that God would have us to do. But then as soon as things begin to lighten up, we begin to drift away over and over again. Beloved, can, can I say this to you tonight? Can I say that it should not take punishment for us to pray or to read our Bible? It shouldn't take punishment from God. I mean, we should have the attitude of the psalmist did in Psalm 103, verse 2. Bless, uh, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. Amen. I heard an example one time put like this. I heard an example of a carpenter working on a 10-story building and he was up on the 10-story floor and as he was hammering away, his foot slipped and he fell. And as he was falling to his death, he screamed out, Lord, help me. And his overalls called a nail on another piece of wood. And he hung there. And he says, ah, never mind, Lord, the nail caught me. How often do we do that? But the Lord comes to our rescue. And the minute he comes to our rescue, we just forget all of his benefits and his blessings in our life. Israel is in the midst of great punishment, extreme poverty. Look in verse 6. It states, greatly impoverished. In this poverty... In the poverty that drives Israel to repentance, this is what David writes. Psalm 119, verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. It is the troubles which lead us to the Lord quite often. But we need to learn that when we come to God in the midst of the troubles, we need to learn to stay there. We need to learn to be close to Him. We need to learn to draw as close as we can, humanly speaking, Unto the one who loved us enough to save us. And beloved, can I tell you this tonight? There is no one on this planet today that loves you more than the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a parent as much as your parents love you and love me. There's not a parent on the face of this planet that loves us greater than Christ. There's not a leader in this world that loves us greater than Christ. There is no one on the face of this planet in the history of mankind that loves us as the Lord Jesus Christ loves us. So my friend, we shouldn't allow troubles to be the only thing that drives us to the feet of Jesus. But rather we ought to go to Him because He first loved us. That's why we love Him. So we see here tonight that there's a prophetical piece of the picture. We find that that prophetical piece of the picture we see in the midst of Judges 6, the punishment. But in the midst of the punishment, God raises up a man. And he's introduced in our story simply as the prophet. Look in verse 8 with me again. The Bible says that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said uh, unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. Guys, this is the first time the word prophet shows up since Deuteronomy 34 verse 10. 
This prophet is anonymous. He's like the prophets of 1 Kings 13 and chapter 20 and 2 Kings 9 and 2 Chronicles 25. Uh, that, doesn't mean, uh, that doesn't mean that there were not any prophets during the time of Moses' writing or to the time of where we are. Uh, for we know that Joshua was a prophet. He prophesied, if you will, about Jericho. I'm just saying this is the first mention of prophets since Moses' last book. So beloved, prophets were men of God that were raised up out of nowhere. During the times of declension, during the times of trouble, during the times of trials, uh, listen, <clears throat> these prophets would, uh, uh, would stand against the, the people of God uh, in times of controversy, but He would stand typically against His own people. So often we think about prophets coming against the lost and coming against the world and <laughs> Even today, we get into the pulpits, and, and, and I touched on it just a moment ago, and we spend so much time preaching against the sin of this world, and we should. We should rebuke the sin of this world, amen? Uh, sin is, listen, it I don't care if it's 2016. What was wrong 100 years ago is still wrong today. And it doesn't matter if 99% of the people in the world say that it's right. If God says it's wrong, it's still wrong, amen? So tired to many a time from a man of God will get in the pulpit and he's just attacking the things of this world. And whereas I understand there's a time that that needs to happen, the prophets were raised up to preach against God's people. Preach against what God's people were doing wrong. Because the people of God had been in a backslidden state and they were. Essentially, the Lord brought them out of nowhere. And you know what He did? He just turned them loose, basically. He says, preach, man. A good example we see with Amos. Amos 7, verse 14 and 15. Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said to me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. It's just like Elijah. Elijah was no one special. He was from a small town in Gilead. But God raised him up to become one of the greatest prophets of all of the Bible. And we know that he's standing at the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've already seen what he's going to be doing here in, uh, in the years to come in the midst of the tribulation period. Guys, there's seven periods of prophecy in the Bible. I want to go over them quickly tonight so that we can understand that God brings up a prophet to preach to his people so his people may get right. Because I can go ahead and tell you right now, the lost and dying of this world tonight are not going to get right when the people of God haven't gotten right. Amen. Seven periods of prophecy in the Bible. The first was from Abraham to, I'm sorry, from Adam to Abraham. God himself gives the first prophecy in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Enoch, we know, prophesied according to Jude 14 and 15. And so did Noah, as we find in Genesis chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. The second period of prophecy is from Abraham to Moses. Both are called prophets in Genesis 20 and Deuteronomy 34. Jacob, we know, prophesied in Genesis 49. And Aaron was called by Moses. Uh, he was called uh, Moses' prophet by God in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. The third time of prophecy runs from Moses to Joel. And I want you to remember the prophets, both major and minor, are not in chronological order when you read the Bible. Joel takes, up, uh, uh, takes us up to the exile, uh, which is the period of Samuel. And, uh, um, it takes us up to the exile, uh, which is the period of Samuel and David and Elijah, as well as others, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Jonah, etc., and those prophets. So that's the third. The fourth uh, time of prophecy, the fourth periods of prophecy, I should say, is from Joel to Malachi, and it covers the exile to post-exile periods of Israel's history. It would include Ezekiel and Daniel and the major prophets uh, and Haggai and Zechariah and Malachi uh, within the minor prophets. And this will go to the end of the Old Testament and it's followed by a period of silent years where no revelation or no prophecy was given at all. The fifth period of prophecy was when Christ was on earth. He was a prophet like unto Moses according to Acts chapter 3. And this period would include it would include um, the forerunner of Jesus, which is John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 9. When Jesus Christ was born, the wise men brought him myrrh, according to Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. And myrrh is representative of Christ's office as a prophet. We have a sixth period of prophecy in the Word of God, and that goes from Pentecost to the rapture of the church. 
That's Acts chapter 2 to a time that we don't know yet. It is the Holy Spirit here that is on the earth prophesying now in the body of Christ in this age. Revelation 19 verse 10 says the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Listen to this carefully tonight. If you have the indwelling Holy Ghost inside of you, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 19, you are a prophet who can for sure tell the world where you are going when you die. Now, here's what you're thinking. Wait a second. I've always thought prophecy, prophecy was something uh, uh, of revealing an unknown truth. No, sir. Prophecy is just that of prophesying of a truth. Of a real truth reality. That's why a true prophet can never falsely prophesy. You can write down the verses if you want. 1 John 5, 13, Philippians 1, 21, and 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10. If you're here tonight and you're saved and born again, you can prophesy exactly where you are going when you die without a shadow of a doubt unto this world. Now what you can't do is prophesy where I'm going. Amen? Because you, I mean, you trust that I'm saved and I know that I'm saved, but that's my job. I'll prophesy where I'm going to go. You prophesy where you're going to go. And we're always to have an answer to give unto any man to ask him for the hope that lieth in us. Somebody comes to you and say, hey, listen, uh, where are you going when you die? I'm going to heaven. Well, how do you know that? Well, because I go to church. That ain't going to help you. Well, I got baptized. Well, that ain't going to help you either. Where are you going when you die? I'm going to, I'm going to heaven when I die. Be absent from the body. Be present with the Lord. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins and I accepted His salvation. I accepted His free gift. That's prophesying of where you will be at the end of your life or when the rapture comes. The seventh and the final period of prophecy occurs during tribulation period. That's Revelation 1 and 7. After that, there is no more prophets. As a matter of fact, uh, in the millennium, if someone tries to prophesy in the millennium, they will be dragged out by their own parents and killed. This is Zechariah 13, verses 1 through 3. Prophecy is over with in the millennium. Prophecy is done with after the tribulation period. There's only seven periods of prophecy in this world. Now there are people today that claim to be prophets. There are people today that make generalized claims that and when something happens, they say, see, I told you so. That will be the equivalent of me tonight saying, listen, something terrible is getting ready to happen here pretty soon. A plane is going to crash here pretty soon. And then a year from now, when it happens, I go say, see, I told you, I told you. Some terrible story. That's what they do today, guys. Beloved, uh, that's not how it works. How it works in a prophecy is a prophet will acknowledge what God says in his book and only in his book, and a prophet will never go outside of his book. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. On top of all these things, prophets are specific. Just like the book has told us that it gives us people by name, just as Josiah was given in 1 Kings 13, Cyrus in Isaiah 48, uh, 44, verse 28, and 45, verse 1. We find that it gives the time of where they're going to be born, Micah 5, 2, and it tells when they're going to die, Psalms 22, verse 16, and why they're going to die, Isaiah 53, verse 10. That's what a prophet does. So without continuing in this direction, I want us to understand that the truth of the matter is this. A prophet of God is raised up by God to warn the people of God to turn back to Him in Judges chapter 6. The prophet stops short here in the 10th verse in giving the promise of delivery. But it is implied that God will deliver them. And here's what we find finally tonight. We find out the mighty hand of God's providence. If you look at verse 11 with me, the Bible says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abazirite, and the son of Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, uh, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. The Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, <laughs> and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? He said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in 
my Father's house. Beloved, this is the Lord God coming to earth and speaking unto Gideon. This is not an angel. This is a, the angel of the Lord. This is the same angel who wrestled with Jacob in Genesis 32. This is the same one who is defined as the appearance of Jehovah God in Hosea 12, verses 4 and 5. This is the same one when Moses spoke with the Lord face to face in Exodus 33, 11 and Deuteronomy 34, 10. He was speaking to the angel of the Lord just like Gideon. Guys, when God appeared unto men in the Old Testament, this is how he did that. When John writes, uh, when John wrote, no man has seen God at any time in John chapter 1 verse 18 and 1 John 4 12, he is referring to the essence, referring to his soul. The Lord told Moses that thou, uh, thou canst not see my face, so there, uh, so there shall no man see me and live. Exodus 33 20. Yet Moses wrote about talking to God, watch this, face to face. I believe he even goes on it as a friend. Amen. He's referring to God appearing to men and speaking to them as the angel of the Lord. This is why a correct study of angels is needed today. A biblical, accurate uh, study of angels is needed more than ever today in our world. The Lord addresses Gideon as a mighty man of valor. Now, it's kind of strange considering what he was doing, isn't it? Now, think about this. What was he doing? Look at verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, um, which was uh, in Ophrah, and pertained unto Joaz, the Eberzerite, and the son of Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press, watch this, to hide it from the Midianites. To hide it. Think about this for just a second here. He's threshing wheat in a low place, which is typically done in a high place so the winds can blow away the shaft as he threshes the wheat and throws them up into the air. But he's down in a low place hiding from the Midianites. I mean, you got to stop and think, man. He's hiding. He's afraid. He's scared. And the Lord addresses him as a mighty man of valor. The Lord looks down at him and says, Thou mighty man of valor. This is where we see the power and providential hand of our Lord intervene. Gideon is hiding out because he's afraid. But God, the Lord, is raising up a deliverer in this man. Remember, God's interest is more in our availability and our dependability than he ever will be interested in our ability. God has provided a deliverer through a man who is in a hiding, threshing wheat. Look in verse 15. And he said unto him, O oh, my Lord, wherewithal shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. He's saying, man, listen, I'm the smallest, I'm the weakest, I'm the runt, I'm the one that always gets sick, and I'm the one that always has a runny nose, and I'm always coughing, uh, I'm always pale. Listen, why, you're gonna, how am I going to do this? Well, can I give your attention to, to 1 Corinthians 1 tonight? You can read it from up top. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, Paul says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men are after the flesh, and not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, uh, uh, things of the world, which, uh, and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory. In his presence. Beloved, we're just about done, and I know that it's been long. But if there was going to be a deliverer of Israel from all these ostracized, uh, uh, disgruntled descendants of Abraham that were sent out, somebody probably would have looked over there at the biggest, strongest guy, the mightiest warrior. The one that was picking up, you know, tractor tires with one arm and, 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 you know, picking up boulders with the other one and he was walking and he was just massive. And yet God looks down in the valley where no one can see. And a little old guy, a weak guy, and his whole family, the weakest one that there was, threshing wheat, doing this. Every time he 
throw that, sh that, that weed up in the air for that wind to, to catch the chafe. Undoubtedly, he probably had to work four and five times harder because of the lack of wind down in the valley, but yet his life was at stake. God looked down. He says, Thou mighty man of valor. He's the last one that we would look at and consider to be the man that God will choose. Let me go ahead and tell you guys, we can look around our streets tonight in Abraham and we can look around our village and our valley. And we can look at some of the blokes that are going around. We can look at some of these young boys that are running around on scooters and kicking balls and playing rugby and doing the things that they do around here. And somebody say, that's the last one in the world right there that will ever pastor a church. That's the last one right there that will ever be a missionary sent out of the, the UK, sent out of Wales, sent out of the Kenny Valley. Somebody may say, hey, wait a second, man, I don't live in the, the capital of Wales. I don't live in London. I don't have the education given from Oxford. I don't have an education from Cambridge. I don't have uh, the ability to speak like so many of my counterparts today. <laughs> I'm just from down there in the Kenning Valley. I'm down there in the village of Abraham and just a handful of people in these streets. And God said, yeah, I'm going to choose you to be a missionary over to the Philippines. I'm going to choose you to be a missionary over to Ethiopia. I'm going to choose you to be a missionary over in Iran. I'm going to choose you and send you out that you may preach the light in the darkness of this world. You may look down and look at that one young man and say, I'm going to choose you to take the helm of a local Bible-believing church there in the Kenyan Valley. You say, well, man, I don't even know who my daddy is. I don't even know who my mama is. I've been in trouble left and right, but all I know is I got saved and I'm born again, and I just want to love you, Lord. Beloved, I'm telling you here tonight that between God's power and God's providence, we look at the guys that seem like they have everything going for them. And we say, that's a mighty man of valor, and God's going, no, let me look behind him. At that little guy that's hiding from maybe the bullies in town. Let me look at that little guy there that's in hiding. He, he's hiding so nobody sees him, so no attention is drawn to him. I'm, I'm going to take you. I'm going to take her. You see, beloved, there's seven qualities that were found in Gideon to make him fit for service for God. Number one, he had a conviction of his true state. He says, man, I'm, from, I'm the least in my family. Who am I? He, number two, he had no confidence in the flesh. And that is a requirement according to Philippians 3.3. 3. But he had an attentive ear. Number three, an attentive ear to God's word. The minute the Lord spoke to him, he, said, he, he addressed him and listened to him. If you look down in verses 25 and 27, you find that he was obedient in the small things. And it came to pass in the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullet of the seven of seven years, and throw down the altar of Baal and thy father hath, that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the, or, in, in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. There was an order that God gave him. There was an order, there was a line, there was a, a specific order that he was to follow. But he could kick back and say, wait a second, I thought I was the mighty man of valor. I'm the guy that's going to defeat the Midianites. Why don't you get somebody else to kill those bullets? Why don't you get somebody else to go count which ones it, uh, that I need to get? Go get somebody else to tear that off and out of the building. And I'm not even a builder. I'm a, I was in the wheat. He was obedient in the small things. Beloved, don't ever expect to do the big things in life if you're not obedient in the small things. Amen. Number five, he had the power for great things. God's power and providence in verse 34, if you look over there. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezar was gathered after him. <laughs> he had power for great things because of the providential and powerful hand of God. He was unafraid to criticize false religions. Verse 27, we find that through verse 32. We won't read all of those. But Gideon took his ten men in the service and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household, the men of the city, that they could not do it by day, and they did it by night. And he went on down. Verse 28, we find he was unafraid to criticize false religions. 
I'm not saying we should go on witch hunts today, but I will tell you this. Right is right and wrong is wrong. And when things are wrong, they're still wrong. No matter if they feel right, if they're wrong, they're wrong. And we find this young man who was in hiding, who was sifting wheat down there, threshing wheat. He wasn't afraid to stand against those who believed differently. And lastly, he got the peace of God through grace. Look at verse 17. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. He got the peace of God through grace. These are the characteristics, my friend, that God is looking for in His service. The first one is the primary requirement just to enlist. A soul, in order for a soul to be saved, we need to know that we need to be saved. Knowing our true state for who and what we are in light of who and what Jesus Christ is. The God of creation. We've got to understand that we're not. He's the Lord of salvation and we're not. We need Him for salvation and He wants to save us. And that is where it starts, beloved. The rest is part of Christian growth and growing toward the Lord. Those seven qualities was found in this young man who was hiding for his life, threshing wheat in a place that was not conducive to thresh wheat. But God didn't have a problem finding him, did he? He said, you're a mighty man of valor. Maybe you're here tonight. Man, woman, or child. Maybe you're here this evening and you just don't know what you have to offer this world. You know, God's not interested in what you can offer the world. He's interested in you being available and dependable to offer Him to the world. Maybe you're here tonight and you're thinking, but preacher, you don't know what I've done in the past. You don't know what, uh, where my heart is. You, don't know, you just don't know. I don't, you're right, I don't. I don't need to know, but God knows. And just as God visited Gideon, when this nation of Israel was seven years in bondage to the hand of the Midianites, and they were on the verge of being wiped out completely, a holocaust, if you will. God went down in the valley and got a boy, the least of his family, the poorest in Manasseh, shaking in his boots, for lack of better terms, threshing wheat so he could feed maybe himself and his family. God said, no. Your farming days are over, son. Thou art a mighty man of valor. For you will defeat the Midianites and save Israel. Can I tell you this tonight, guys, that I'm done? If you're here tonight and you're saved and you're born again of the blood of Christ, if you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you know that if you die without a shadow of a doubt tonight, that you would go to heaven. First off, if you don't know that, you need to get it right now. You need to confess Him as Lord and Savior and you need to be born again of the blood of Christ and accept Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life and give your life on this earth over to Him as He has granted you life with Him beyond this realm. But number two, you got the power inside of you of God's providential hand. Just like Gideon did. Just like Gideon defeated the wickedness of the Midianites and we know the rest of the story not read the rest of Judges 6 and the mighty works that he did, but I'm here to tell you this. You've got the power tonight in you to allow waters of life to flow to the lost and dying. And it doesn't matter who the enemy is. You may sit here tonight and say, well, you don't know my wife. You don't know my husband. You don't know my children. You don't know my neighbors. I know your neighbors. But you say, you may not know who they are. Well, they're just too far gone. They're not going to listen. No one is too far gone. The Lord's hand is not shortened that He cannot save. His ear is not shortened that He cannot hear. My Lord God can save any soul in this world today. It's our job to make sure we give them the opportunity. Guys, that is God's power. And that's His providential hand that we can see in His deliverance from Israel, even in our life tonight. If we'll just be a willing vessel, He's not interested in your ability tonight, but rather your availability and dependability. The choice is yours. I'm going to ask you to accept the challenge tonight when you pray. I'm going to ask you to accept the challenge this evening to maybe be the next Gideon, to maybe be the next George Mueller, to maybe be the next Franny Crosby, 
to, to may be the next uh, uh, John Newton. Who knows? Maybe just be the next soul winner in the Kenan Valley. Maybe just be the next person that witnesses somebody in Abraham and, and they get saved. Maybe just be who God wants us to be. And that's as close as possible to Him. Serving Him with fervor and serving Him with desire. Will you bow your hands to Him? Father in heaven, we do thank You, Lord, for the mercy and grace You've had on us, Lord God. We thank You for the opportunity to be together. Father, I realize tonight that the services of been a little bit different. And I understand, dear God, that we've been a little bit long. Father, I pray that Thy Holy Spirit, Lord, would be inside of each and every one of our lives tonight. That we would not forget the goodness of God and forget not the wonderful grace that You've given into our days. Lord, we would be as this young man getting and knowing our true state, but giving heed unto Thy Word and knowing that Your power will be with us. Let us be a witness unto this world today. Father, I love you and I thank you and I give you praise, glory, and honor for everything that has been said. I pray that you let us not soon forget all that you've given us and all that you've done. In Christ's precious name we ask. Amen.